So good morning, everybody. So nice to, to see almost all of you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, this isn't might. I, I'm very comfortable speaking loudly. I would say just, um, Aaron, can you hear me? Okay, so as we hand the mic around, or the virtual mic, if you can't hear Peter, just say, I can't hear. Um, so I'm really excited to see so many people. Uh, this is the second of four forums we will be doing across our four campuses. Uh, later this afternoon, we're in Providence at the Liston campus, and then uh, not next week, uh, but the following week, we will close out the four at Newport. Um, you know, I think what I will say is incredibly obvious. Um, they're helpful for the community because you all are going to be learning what's sort of uh, top of mind for this group. They're very helpful to my team because the questions that we hear from all of you obviously are really significant indicators for what are our campuses thinking about, what's on your minds. So with that, uh, we did relatively well in Lincoln with having it split sort of evenly between we're going to make some remarks for the first 30 minutes, and then we're really going to turn it over to the room for conversation. Um, so with that, uh, I wanted to just sort of present how we're going to make the, the next 30 minutes run. Uh, I am going to make just a couple of very brief remarks based on what my, I will say, interpretation is of what I anticipate state funding is going to look like uh, for next year. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it right over to Vice President Patton, who's going to walk us through some further observations about the budgeting and how we're thinking about our finances and then give a brief update on our facilities at which point I'll turn it over to the team of Vice President Costigan and Enright who will sort of tag team through um, the highlighted initiatives we've all been working so hard on over the last eight and a half months. I also have our Director of Institutional a uh, Equity Alfonso Atkins and our Chief of Staff Alix Ogden who are sort of ready to take on any questions that we may need some support answering. And finally, if you all have some great million dollar questions that we can't answer, we'll take them down and get right back to you. So um, with that, as, as a frame for some of what you will be hearing from folks to my right and my left, um, there are just two observations I want to offer as, as you listen to them. Uh, the first is, so many of these uh, were begun by many of you in this room long before I ever walked into this college as your new president. So, so much of the work that has now crossed the finish line or is nearing the finish line um, is a result of many, many people in this room and who are parts of your teams and your departments who devoted, in some cases, years to getting this work done. So I feel enormously grateful that the work that has happened over the last eight and a half months is the result of that just persistence and that refusal to give up on what you know is the best thing for our students and, and for the college. My second observation is when the team comes into my office and reports on what's going well and maybe what's not going so well with some of the initiatives we're launching, um, I, I will offer this. Uh, with so many of these things, it is the first iteration, and we are going to make it the best first iteration this college can, can pull off. What I would ask for all of you is the understanding that the 2.0 is going to be better than the 1.0, and the 3.0, it's like the iPhone. And so um, I say that um, with a great deal of sincerity, that we, in order to make the 2.0, we're going to need a lot of feedback from everyone in this room, from our students, from the, the remainder of our faculty and our staff. And so I, I guess I'm asking for two things with that comment. The first is um, an acceptance that we're going to have some improvement to do with these initiatives we're rolling out. You know, we absolutely will have places where we know we need to improve. And then the second observation is the only way we're going to improve it is by getting feedback from all of you and by getting feedback from our students. So it'll be our job to make sure we you know, create ways to get that feedback effectively. And what I'm asking you to do is give us the feedback. Um, so with that, uh, let, me, let me just move to what my observations are uh, about state financing. Uh, Alix and I spent about 90 minutes yesterday with the governor and with her chief of staff, who is her uh, sort of signature advisor on education. Um, 
And, and this is what we're hearing. And we're hearing it whether it's those meetings, whether it is heading to the meeting of the post-secondary council, whether it's having conversations with legislators. And I think what I'm about to say is not going to surprise anyone. I just want to make sure that we're all sort of hearing the same thing together collectively in the room because it will be our charge to react to what we're hearing. And that is simply this. Um, if you look at higher education practices uh, nationally, there is absolutely a, a movement afoot to uh, run ever leaner institutions. So um, I feel about this conversation, frankly, the same way I felt about performance-based funding when I arrived on February 1st. We can absolutely have thoughtful conversations about whether these things are good or bad for our students, for ourselves, and for higher education. Uh, and the fact is, we are a public institution, and we report to a post-secondary council and to a governor and ultimately to the General Assembly. So I think what we, what we need to do together is, I think, two things. Do everything we can continually to influence the people I've just iterated, right? post-secondary council, governor and her team, general assembly, that is obviously a, an enormous part of my job, of my charge, but it also is everyone in this room, right? Really telling the story of the work you do every day and the impact it has on our students and ultimately on the state. Um, the second thing I will say is I, I actually believe this college is in a, um, very strong position to make a very compelling case uh, that we are extremely good value for our students. So as I said to the governor yesterday, frankly, our college has a long list of challenges and we can talk about them for days. Um, I, I did tell the governor, I actually don't think the first or the biggest challenge of this college is that we're too expensive. So hear me clearly when I say, we're gonna play very close attention to what our tuition looks like and how expensive it is when you are a first generation college student coming to this college. And we're gonna look at all sorts of pilots like how do we think about moving our textbooks online so our students aren't taking hundreds of dollars out of their own pocket to cover the, te the cost of textbooks. But I will tell you, um, when I think about other institutions, certainly the privates, and even our four-year colleagues, I think they have a different challenge, which is really how do you make a college education more affordable? Um, so, so I will simply say, if I, if I listen closely to what I'm hearing, and it, there is some, something of reading tea leaves in this, right? You listen very closely to what you're hearing. At the end of the day, it's gonna be what's put on a piece of paper and what's signed into law for the following year. Um, my sense is I think she is going to look very favorably at a budget that asks for an increase, a budget increase uh, in tuition. And I, I, if I am positing what I anticipate will happen in terms of the amount of funding we get from the state, I do think it will be an increase over last year. So, so Dave is gonna walk you through that, I think, and give you a sense of what we hope, certainly what we're gonna ask for, and what we hope to receive. Um, the last two comments I wanna make about the state, and then I'm gonna hand it to Dave, um, are this. Uh, if, if you, like me, are doing a lot of reading about what's going on nationally that is getting the attention of, of, of people like the governor and others, um, I think you look at states like Tennessee, I'm sure you all saw that the governor in the last two weeks has announced her intention that by 2025, 70% of working age Rhode Islanders are gonna have some form of a post-secondary credential. We're at 44% right now. So, you know, my, my belief is she basically looked at Tennessee. Tennessee has a goal of 55%. Uh, they're at 32% right now, and I think this is a governor who has big ambitions for the state of Rhode Island and said, we're gonna go for, we're gonna go for 70%. Um, where, if I look at this room and you think about growth, so to get to 70% is any form of a post-secondary credential, right? It could be a certificate, it could be an associate degree, it could be a four-year degree, it could be a graduate degree. So of that, uh, let's see, 44, to, that's, what is that? 28, is that, someone help me. 26. 26. Where are the math teachers? 26% um, growth. Where, where do you anticipate that, that the governor and the post-secondary council are looking for most of that growth to happen? Two-year, four-year graduate school. Anybody? 
right here, yes. Um, so I share that with you. Um, in our conversation yesterday, we spent a lot of time advancing the idea of a collective impact model, right? So if you, if you do the raw math, it's roughly 12,000 additional certificates or degrees against what this college is doing on its own, right? So that's enormous growth. And what we were very clear, I think, in our communication is we can't wait to get going with this, and we're going to do our part, right? We are really focused on serving the 15,000 students that are here with us right now even more effectively. We are really focused on thinking about a reverse transfer strategy that's going to bring folks back to us. So we're happy to talk about what we're going to do in order to get to 12,000 a year for the next 10 years. That's, that's a collective impact model. It's going to absolutely involve our four-year publics. It's going to involve our four-year privates. And just getting her thinking about the way you do this is by bringing everybody to the table. And by everybody, what I mean by that is it, it means bring all of the four years, bring our two year, bring our key employers, bring all of the state agencies, and, and really come together and say how we're going to do 12,000 a year. Um, my second observation, so the first is how do we graduate, you know, 70 percent, have 70 percent of our population by 2025 have some form of post-secondary credential. The second is um, on how do we control costs. And how do we think about funding our public higher ed institutions? And in that regard, um, it's clear to me that one of the examples that she and her team are looking at is the Maryland example. And um, I think that is, I sh it's very early stages. The team has yet to even begin talking about what that looks like. Um, I share it with you because I think we are going to have an opportunity to think about um, as we go forward and begin to think about, say, a five-year plan and where we are investing now, where we want to grow our investment, where we want to redirect where we currently are, are spending in order to, um, frankly, meet what the post-secondary council is asking us to do. So um, I, I uh, assure you that as those conversations get underway, um, you will be hearing from us as we need input from everyone in this room and as we're learning kind of which way the water is flowing with these conversations. So the, with that respect, in terms of sort of running a lean institution, it's very early days um, that really the first conversations are just now uh, beginning. So, so with that, I'll hand it over to Vice President Patton. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, all. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the budget process that we're in, as Sharon and her team can tell you. Uh, we're working on three fiscal years at a time. We're currently in FY17. We're finishing up an audit of FY16 last year. We're planning for FY18 next year. So there's three years at play here. Uh, the budget request for FY18 went in last month. And so that process started last month, actually before that, when uh, Ruth Barrington and her team were putting the numbers together. We submitted that uh, uh, request for the budget uh, for FY18 and sometime on or before uh, June of next year, the General Assembly will vote on that. It goes through, as uh, many of you are aware, a process of uh, having hearings at the Senate and the House at the State House. Goes, first it goes through the Council, then the Board of Ed, and then on to uh, the General Assembly, the Governor, and then the General Assembly, and then the final decision comes in June. And that's when we take the number we get and kind of sift it out and, and, and figure out what that means to individual lines in our budget. Uh, we made a couple assumptions. Our uh, budget request includes a 5% tuition increase. Uh, as President Hughes uh, alluded to earlier, we have a strategic advantage here where we're a low-cost option for students. And as a former uh, CCRI student, I'll say it's not only a low cost but a high value. Um, it is, um, uh, I think, Connecticut and Maine are the two states that have lower costs. You know, if you look at New England region, um, the other New England states are higher, so we're about in the middle of the pack there. Uh, also, we are the lowest cost option for higher education locally when you consider that students could also go to RIC, URI, uh, Bristol Community College, or uh, New England Tech, which is the most expensive fancy buildings cost money and somebody's got to pay for that. 
So that pro budget process, we're in um, to the extent that any of you have uh, friends or family members that have some influence in that area, feel free to uh, share, uh, share your, put your voice with ours and ask for support for the college. Um, we'll, uh, we'll know that again in June or before, uh, but most likely in June when we get the final budget. Um, we also are consolidating some fees, so we're eliminating a few fees, uh, you know, minor fees, and consolidating it all to a registration fee. So that should simplify the fee structure for the college. You can only do that, you know, even though it's separate from tuition related, but uh, you can only have uh, make a change to the fee structure once a year when you submit the budget. So we're trying to simplify that there. I tell people I was standing outside the elevator on the sixth floor, and somebody said, and Maybe they said it because I was there. I don't think they knew who I was, but they said, oh, don't use the elevator. They'll charge you an elevator fee, right? <laughs> so, um, so there's a perception out there that, you know, there's too many fees for every odd little thing. So simplifying that and streamlining that will help, and that will give uh, our new marketing person and the marketing group something to uh, talk about there as well. Um, I think that's it on budget. I'm going to just touch briefly on uh, capital projects, even though you know it's always a uh, an issue. There'll never be enough resources, right? Even Donald Trump has a budget. So we have um, uh, the last word on budget. I'll say is about redirection and innovation. Uh, we're we're working uh, in uh, Rosemary's group and I and Peter and several other people are working on this uh, seniority listing for part-time faculty association. So uh, a way that we could do that in a, in a simpler and more efficient way is to how the data is organized and have a better listing of seniority for part-time faculty. Um, so that involves not just working harder, but also using the systems we have in a, in a more effective way. So we're, in fact, Rosemary and I were talking about that just this morning. So uh, there are ways, if, look for ways that you can redirect and innovate. Uh, and also I would say, you know, I look at it uh, that Sarah, Rosemary, and I working together, you know, Rosemary and the faculty have the product that we are selling to uh, students, you know, good programs and good quality faculty. Uh, Sarah's group uh, really on the customer service end and helping students, welcoming them, getting them registered and so forth. Um, and it's really about the role that each of us has, whether you're in maintenance or you're, you're a faculty or a chair, or whatever, helping students feel welcome here and, and really taking advantage of the good programs that we have. So that all comes back to enrollment, which is uh, the thing that keeps me up at night is, uh, you know, it's how we pay our bills with enrollment. So uh, that helps. So we, we've seen a decline in enrollment. We have to stem that tide and get that back up there. So. Um, I'll say briefly on capital projects, in spite of, you know, always having some challenges with uh, budget, uh, we're spending a lot of money, uh, over $50 million uh, is our capital plan for the college. Uh, there's a lot going on here in Warwick with the Warwick renewal. Uh, we have the chemistry renovation uh, project supposed to be scheduled to be finished up in December of this year and the biology renovation will start in January. So we're upgrading uh, facilities. There's been some recent upgrades, as you see, from uh, the art studio and some other things. Um, and the Warwick renewal is a general upgrade of this uh, campus. We do have a Lincoln renewal planned as well. Um, a key piece of the planning of that is a strategic plan uh, that uh, Megan and uh, the rest of the senior team has started working on selecting a firm to help us with that. And again, uh, the other key word I would mention is engagement. Uh, key piece of the strategic planning effort will be uh, engaging uh, all corners of the college to help with that planning effort. So that, in a large way, will drive where we're going to spend that capital money. So I'm going to stop there, and maybe people have questions after we're all done. Uh, happy to answer them, but I'll Perfect. turn it over to Sarah and Rosemary. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Dave. Good morning, everyone. Um, Wow, thank you for being here. I know that, boy, we all have a lot on our plates and a lot going on, and it's really just great to see so many um, bright faces and be part of this team. Uh, I think the piece that I want to talk about first is enrollment, which uh, Vice President Patton just referenced, uh, but just to provide the context in terms of where we are with enrollment. 
So this fall, our headcount, which was frozen on September 22nd, uh, was 15,101 students. Our headcount last fall was 16,195 students. So it's a drop of 7%. And it's a drop of 7% after we experienced a drop of 7.7% between the fall of 2014 and the fall of 2015. Uh, and those are two pretty significant drops in a time period where there have been five straight years of drops in enrollment. So when Dave says it keeps him up at night, uh, it keeps him up at night from a sort of business affairs and financial perspective. It keeps me up at night because it keeps us from fully achieving and fulfilling our mission. We are about being really the only wide open gateway to higher education in this state. We're the only open access institution. We're the only community college. We are the biggest and we want to be doing everything we can to welcome as many Rhode Islanders into our doors each fall and each spring and each summer as we possibly can. Uh, so when we, when we look at that decline that is um, five straight years, we've got to think about that. And I think there are certainly national trends to point to. So we can't say that, um, that it's a complete anomaly, that sort of how did CCRI end up in this place? There, there are different trends going on nationally. There are smaller high school populations. There is a lot of competition from online and other providers. Uh, there's a labor market that's picking up. Rhode Island added 5,000 jobs in the last year. Um, that's all well and good, but here we are and this is our college and we want to make the very best of it. And there are examples of community colleges that are bucking the trend. Uh, and so what I would really ask of everyone in this room and each one of us is what does it look like for us to own this together because in enrollment services we are doing everything we know to do we're doing text-a-thons phone-a-thons mobile recruit teams putting the financial aid application process online streamlining things um, trying to simplify the fee structure but that won't do it alone ultimately we've got to figure out what does it look like for all of us to make ccri the place that people want to come the place that people want to choose when they need to get a full-time education, the place that people want to fit into their lives when they're working adults with a whole host of other responsibilities. And I think the piece, what that means for each of us is going to be different. I think the piece that's shared across the board is student engagement matters and having every student feel like this is a place where they're welcome, this is a place where somebody cares, uh, and this is a place where they're going to achieve their goals. That's what we can all do. Um, and you know, I just had a, a great conversation. Christine was talking about bringing her students to a, a forum and, and uh, it was a, a speech class. Uh, and just sort of the moments and the awakenings that some of these students had uh, through that experience. And it's sort of how do we create as many experiences as possible? And some of them happen in very sort of educational ways. Some of them happen simply because you reach out to a student who you know and you ask them, how's it going? Uh, and so I would encourage everyone, you know, I was, I was telling someone, there's an organization in California uh, that encourages high school students to have me cinco, my five. You know, who are the five people that you look around who are going to help you get to college and help you achieve your goals? Well, I would encourage us as a team to flip that around and say, whether it's five or seven or in the case of faculty, maybe it's 20, but who are the students that you see every day that maybe you could have a three sentence conversation with and that would make a difference? Who, who are the students that you can simply say hello to in passing that you can um, kind of reach out and, and make sure they feel engaged here? So I think that's something that we can and should all own. Um, and I think together we're gonna make this happen. I feel as hopeful and optimistic as ever. I think our students um, need us and they want us to be here and the more welcome and engaged they feel, the more that's going to spread through this state um, and really be a positive thing. So um, enrollment is ours. I, I guess the other piece I would say is that we really welcome ideas. There, there isn't some kind of one magic solution that is here's how, here's how we're going to get enrollment up. It's going to be a collective effort with a lot of pieces. Um, and I'm certain that we don't have all the ideas yet. And I really welcome this whole group and our whole college to to bring those ideas to the table. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Vice President Costigan, who's going to talk about some of our strategic initiatives. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's very nice to see a full room and a great opportunity to update <coughs> everyone on uh, where, where we're at with initiatives within academic affairs. 
Um, one of our, uh, I would say, shining lights this uh, semester that we launched was the multiple measures um, pilot. Uh, this was work that was started two years ago by deans, chairs, faculty, um, enrollment services representatives where uh, literature was reviewed, best practices were reviewed in terms of um, uh, placing students at their optimal level uh, where possible into college gateway courses. So um, uh, criteria was developed, uh, 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 tracking mechanisms were implemented, and this fall we were able to uh, place more than 100 students into college uh, level math or into a math course that would enable them to progress that otherwise would have been placed into developmental math. Um, for English students, that's more than 300. Um, we were overwhelmed with the number of uh, uh, transcripts that we received when we put out that request because prior to um, this initiative, uh, it was not a requirement for students to submit a transcript. So we got over 2,000, I believe, over 2,000 transcripts to analyze. Um, and so this, pro this um, pilot is underway. Uh, I would publicly like to thank everybody that was involved, and in particular right now, I'd like to thank the faculty that are um, on the front lines implementing this. The feedback that I get um, uh, almost on a daily basis uh, from faculty who have sort of unlocked the door uh, to um, helping us improve this pilot, to say um, uh, these students are, are struggling, these students are excelling. It's really helping us to look at what would be benchmarks. How do we improve, as, as uh, President Hughes said, uh, get to 2.0 with this, and then ultimately 3.0. The important thing, and English is also looking, they've been doing this for about three years with accelerated learning pathways, where they're combining um, developmental coursework with a college-ready uh, gateway. We know that for students coming into higher ed, uh, English and math are critical courses. Um, without achieving success in those courses, uh, the, the uh, opportunity for them to move on, um, it, it does diminish. And uh, so we're looking to get those barriers removed where possible. So the multiple measures, just to recap, really is looking at the student as a whole, um, not relying on a single um, AccuPlace or test. Um, the literature has reviewed that um, high school GPAs are very strong. And we're seeing evidence that that is, in fact, uh, the case. Uh, we look forward to the semester continuing and certainly a thorough data review at the end of the semester. Um, but also considering SAT scores, ACT scores, and the AccuPlacer. We're tracking all of those um, indicators and, and identifying how was the student placed in a certain course so that we can go back and look and say, was this, uh, was this a valid way um, to, to move them into uh, College Gateway courses? The models are different. We have an accelerated um, developmental model which com in math, which combines um, two developmental math courses. And then we also have the developmental and the college ready uh, course that is a co-requisite model. Um, these are um, uh, well proven on the national level and we're excited about implementing them. Uh, as far as the English co-requisite model, um, scaling up, looking at I think 31 sections moving in the spring and up to 36 in the fall. Uh, the important thing with multiple measures is that uh, it will increase persistence. When students come in and they're bogged down with one or two semesters of developmental coursework before they get to uh, courses that can facilitate their completion and transfer on if, if they so desire, uh, they leave, they don't persist. So while Sarah talked about enrollment, um, uh, academic affairs, we're very concerned with enrollment as well. And we're also concerned with how do we keep the student here once they get here and, and, and uh, support their success in persisting. Um, another um, initiative uh, is a prior learning assessment uh, for years, in, including the beginning of the, uh, uh, the beginning days of uh, the community college system. Uh, we have taken um, prior learning credits in terms of um, uh, CLEP, um, APA, et cetera. Uh, we have had um, a, a decentralized approach to this, which had multiple statements and not real policy statements uh, scattered throughout our network. So when a student was coming in, 
that had either um, look, was looking for a portfolio option or a CLEP option. There wasn't one stop shopping, so to speak. So we were fortunate enough with the TAC-3 grant um, to have um, a portion of that deliverable to be uh, focusing on developing a policy, institutional, and one that actually goes beyond the college. Uh, to develop a uh, standard of prior learning policy for the college. Uh, the important thing with the prior learning policies, uh, uh, several things, but one is that students um, do not have to search uh, tirelessly through uh, websites, et cetera. So that we will have videos that are going to be um, on the main web page so that if a student is interested in a portfolio, they can go and look and, and, and be instructed on how to access that. There will also be a policy that explains what and how a student can proceed uh, that's clear. By NEASC, we're required to have a, a policy uh, that addresses prior learning and is accessible and clear to everyone who accesses it. Uh, recently, we had a, um, a proposal put forth before the Academic Advisory Committee, um, which was uh, uh, supported unanimously, and that will then be forwarded over to the President's Council, uh, and we will keep you updated on, on that process. Um, as I said, the policy codifies what we were already doing and makes it clear it's in one it's in one area, and in terms of persistence, uh, we do know that the research shows us students who come in who receiving prior learning credit um, uh, persist at higher rates and they complete at higher rates. So um, uh, that that's a very very important um, aspect. Currently, we have less than one percent of our students accessing prior learning, and um, we're looking to increase that. Um, and we are also um, under the guidance of Dr. Doug Floor, who has come in as the, through the grant, through our prior learning assessment coordinator, also developing um, two task forces. Um, for those of you that may not be familiar with prior learning, how it works, uh, there's a hierarchy of that. So when you get up at the top, we have CLEP and you have um, ACE credits and um, uh, uh, AP. There's, there's a hierarchical um, uh, format of what is transferable. So we could give, for instance, you get down more into the lower levels, uh, your portfolios, your departmental challenge exams. When you get to portfolios, departmental challenge exams, they may not be uh, transferable to another college for that same credit. They many times will take it as elective. So Dr. Floor is um, uh, recruiting faculty to form two task forces that will address um, setting standards and rigor for the departmental challenge exams as well as for the portfolio process. So exciting times, um, lots of good work, and excited about um, what comes next. Great. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, so I think I'm going to talk next about, we've just gone through a lot of what's going on now, and I want to start to point us in the direction of, and where will we go from here? Uh, and again, I think this ties to the idea that there were many great initiatives that were started here, uh, and they simply need to be carried forward and sort of carried across the finish line. And I think Guided Pathways is the next significant one of those initiatives that we're going to pick back up. And I'm looking at Dean Sullivan here because, uh, you know, starting in 2014, maybe before then, starting in 2014, uh, with an internal task force, the college recognized, hey, we have many students every day who we meet in the Great Hall, we see in the classroom, we interface with, we have them on our athletic teams who are saying, boy, I'd really benefit from some more structure. Uh, and it makes sense if you intuitively think through it, two thirds of our students are first generation college students. They come here and we present them with this beautiful array of 95, maybe it's 94, you know, Bill and I are still figuring out the exact number as of today, but 95 degree and certificate programs at this college. Uh, wow, that's a lot to choose from. When you're coming out of uh, high school where everything was structured for you each day, or you're coming out of a, a work environment that you've been in for 10 years where it's really clear what you do and how you succeed, to come here and to choose from 95 things is um, not that simple. So 
what the, the work that has already been undertaken was to say, well, how do we start to structure that around a set of pathways that are maybe five or seven pathways that students can choose from? So they can say, oh yeah, well, I don't know exactly which major concentration I want, but I know for sure that I'm not interested in healthcare and uh, not interested in the humanities, but I kind of like uh, business or maybe technology. Is there something like that? And what might I take in my first semester or my first year that would move me in that general direction? Um, and there's already a, a, a very healthy report that came out of that group uh, that made some recommendations around how do we move forward with this. So the next steps really between now and the fall of 2018 are to say what are some interim steps? Are there some pathways that we want to start to put in place for the fall for the 2017-2018 school year? And then when we look at the fall of 2018, boy, we want to have a guided pathway system in place so that every student who's showing up at our doors has a clear and simplified set of choices in front of them. Um, obviously, a student can still choose anything. Someone could come in and say, forget your guided pathways model. I don't need that. I know exactly what I want to do. I've looked at the 95 and I want this one. Or actually, I'm, I'm not here with a, an interest in a degree or certificate program at all. I want to explore. So there will always be situations that, that don't fit the model. But I think given what we're hearing from the vast majority of our students, we need a model that has far more structure than we have in place today. Um, and I think the reason that I bring it up today is it is another one of those initiatives that's going to require real collective ownership across the college. It is going to require making academic decisions about what fits together and what is the recommended first semester that cuts across multiple disciplines and positions our students for success. Um, what is the advising model that gives students some sort of assessment or method at the outset that helps them if they can't even choose from five options? Um, and what is the advising that supports someone as they go from that first semester to then starting to, to choose from the majors or the disciplines within that pathway? So there are a lot of questions for us to answer together. And um, what I would say is if anyone has a particular interest in being involved in this, for sure there will be um, a committee group or task force that carries this forward and we really are going to welcome and encourage as much engagement as possible. So please um, do see me if you want to be a part of, of that work. Uh, and then in terms of being a part of that work, I think I'll let Vice President Costigan speak to the many opportunities um, that are available today and as we move forward to, to get engaged in, in some of this work. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and, and it is absolutely critical that uh, faculty are involved in these processes. And we're looking to open up as many opportunities to have faculty involvement um, as we move forward. Some task forces that are in the planning phases and or initial steps, um, a completion task force. So getting uh, faculty who are the experts um, and working with um, uh, advising and counseling to look at how can we improve and support our students. Enrollment. Enrollment, um, it, it transcends every department. Uh, if stu students, uh, they're not in the seats, our classes are canceled. Uh, it has a, a trickle down effect that is, um, uh, it, it is measurable in every sector of the college. Uh, guided pathways, as Vice President uh, Enright just talked to. Uh, classrooms of the future. Uh, this is an initiative as we're going through the Warwick renewal where we have um, some faculty um, working with our IT representatives to um, look at what are some models of classrooms that will be um, uh, supportive to our educators as they uh, teach our students moving forward. Um, uh, opportunities for professional development and growth. Um, and I'm going to combine this with working with our partners uh, at RIDE in K through 12. Um, the, I attended a, um, a, a consortium on Monday that was New England Educators for Secondary Schools. And um, they invited me and it was really a great opportunity. And I was very happy that they did include us because they're actually talking about what the future is going to be in teaching students that are going in through K through 12, which has a direct impact on higher education. Um, one of the things that emerged from that was 
there are going to need to be opportunities for professional growth for their faculty, which we have already identified internally in terms of um, uh, professional development. Um, we're going to have a speaker in in two weeks that's talking on a <coughs> metric that the Academic Affairs uh, Division is going to be following this year, sources and evidence. So be on the lookout. We're going to have um, some banners and some campaigning. And, um, but more importantly, we're going to be doing some uh, strategies in the classroom with our students and then um, uh, reassessing that at the end of the year. Um, the work with K through 12, just very quickly, um, on October 31st, we'll be meeting with um, uh, the math chair, the, the, the English chair. Um, two representatives of faculty from each area, so four faculty, myself. Uh, Sarah is not able to attend, but I will be going. We will be, we will be meeting with the commissioner of um, uh, K through 12, uh, three superintendents from uh, school districts, Providence, Central Falls, and Cumberland, including uh, the principals of those high schools and faculty representatives. And we will be brainstorming how we can um, improve the student readiness when they get to our door uh, once they graduate and, and also looking at models that would um, support developmental education or where those gaps are, I prefer to say gaps, so that when the student comes to us, uh, they are better prepared for, for that work. Um, and, and so from my experience in higher ed for um, nearly 20 years, I can say this is really the first time I think we've had such a, um, a seamless communication uh, pathway with not only our partners in K through 12, but also our partners uh, at the four-year institutions. Um, and I'm going to transition into governance because one of the important ways that we can work together and make sure that everybody's input is, um, is uh, heard and um, uh, considered is that we get our governance structure back on track. Um, Kevin Salisbury is here. He is our compliance officer and I'll just briefly tell you that early on when I came into the role and I met Sarah and Megan, uh, I was hearing from my faculty in the division about the governance structure, that it was complex, that uh, the communication was, um, was difficult. Um, in the spring, we sent out a, a survey which validated those, um, those um, feelings and we have convened the committee, the governance committee, which is um, sort of a steering committee. It's, it's in their um, plan, their, their um, uh, governance plan, and it is the chair. It's the chairs of all of the governance committees. So they've come together. Um, they're going to be reconvening in the next few weeks. They have several proposals in front of them. Uh, to consider and once decisions are made on those, you will be hearing and asking to place your vote on those uh, proposals to change in structures. Um, and I hope that you um, participate and avail yourself. If you are interested, uh, we, need, we need representation, we need faculty representation, and this is how we move the college forward through a strong governance um, um, uh, uh, structure. So. Um, at this point, um, we're also looking at office hours. Um, I know, Sarah, I think you have posted yours or you're communicating yep. that. Um, and I, um, we're looking at uh, Fridays, every other Friday, and Peter is trying very hard to work with a jam-packed uh, <laughs> calendar, but um, we're gonna clear out 90 minutes, and um, I will invite faculty to make appointments and come in and uh, so that we really can have the, um, you know, get the feedback right from uh, the people who are on the, on the front lines. And um, uh, I look forward to that as well. Perfect. So um, either I talked longer or more slowly. So we have, um, I'm going to move us very, very quickly in, into questions um, with just one final observation um, or, or thought. And, and that is really a thank you uh, to everyone in the room. I think about what feels so different today uh, back to February 1st, which is I look around this room and I have been at a table with virtually everyone here and if I haven't been at a table uh, someone from here has been I I have such a sense of the amount of work 
and the quality of the work that is being done. And I know that that is being done in service of our students. Um, if you were to ask me what are the greatest pleasures I have at this college on a daily basis, um, I'll be honest, you know, my number one pleasure is talking to students and listening to them. And the beauty of those conversations, what they say about all of you, the, I, I never fail to say, kind of give me, tell me what's working. Tell me about an interaction you're having with a member of a staff or with one of your teachers. And the stories that come from our students, I mean, it is, it is all of you that are making possible their advancement. So I, I want you to know how grateful I am. I know that is hard work and I, I very much appreciate it. The other comment, um, I do want to make sure everyone hears from me. I, I still have an enormous amount to learn. Eight and a half months, I think I'm a relatively quick learner. There's more to be learned. So please, I have office hours posted on the president's webpage. Please go there. Please make an appointment. Those conversations, they're just one-on-one -on -one conversations, are invaluable for me as I begin to learn more about the entire institution. Um, two, please invite me to your department meetings or your staff meetings. I did a lot of that last spring. It was incredibly valuable for my learning. And then finally, a lot of you in, these, in this room, I am a regular recipient of your emails. That's helpful. I read them night and day. Uh, they really do impact how we think about the work. So I'll just close by saying um, thank you all so much. And uh, let's, let's move to questions. Please, Camille. At the start, I wanted to thank you for rallying all of us to be on the same page. Because I think that's what's really going to matter in work, makes you feel like it. And um, I want to just say a little bit on behalf of the men. Um, do I have a question? I'll find one. <laughs> um, but this whole idea of positioning students for success, and we know some things automatically work. The whole sense of engagement, of, of faculty, of community sharing, of grant. Students come in with some grant preparation. But another piece is definitely that students, and the literature supports this, that students, in fact, their interests, their particularly their skills and their personality, when it matches their major, they're more successful. It consistently shows this. They also are more inclined to graduate. So that piece right there is so significant um, that that's in place and that that's given a voice to and support to as well. Um, I really, and as I work with Joanne, our um, career planning works with Joanne in doing uh, initial, just a, a small assessment during orientation. We're not necessarily seeing students come back because that was the intent, but we need to work on that as well. But the idea of starting very early will support all that we've talked about so far. So far. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things we've seen with colleges that have implemented guided pathways effectively, having an across the board simple but clear form of assessment at the outset is a critical piece of that. So I think as we look at that, what's our project plan from now to the fall of 2018, um, certainly part of the plan when we get to fall of 2018 is every incoming new student is going through some form of assessment. And I, I would just like to add, um, at the New England uh, Secondary School Consortium on Monday, uh, this is happening in K through 12. Uh, so the high schools are looking at, um, and that's the model they're basing um, uh, the curriculum design on, is that students are more engaged when it's in a topic or an area that they have an affinity for, and they are looking to, um, uh, to improve upon that. So we will start to see those students coming in that have clear ideas. The Guided Pathways is a great idea. Um, everyone needs a little structure. Um, my question and concern is, uh, and it's, it's like I can't get out of the non-credit side of the house with my mind, uh, does, is the focus solely on the academic programs? Because there's an awful lot of students who come to CCRI who would probably be be more beneficial for them if they were on the non-credit side of the house, if they were doing a job training program, uh, if they were doing a welding program, a boat building program, you know, the culinary program, the, the office skills uh, program, the CNA program. Some of our students just aren't ready for college level work and they may not be ready for a long time. 
and, and to continue to have them take remedial classes over and over, that's why they're leaving. Uh, and, and if we had this triage when they first came to us, and we could realize that, boy, you know, this person tested in at a fourth grade reading level, why are we letting them sign up for philosophy? Yep. You know? And, and, and the barriers, though, because I worked on the non-credit side of the house for 15 years, the barrier between the non-credit side of the house and the academic side of the house is incredible. Yep. We can't even have our students go to the enrollment counter so Joanne, so I only in the interest of time, I'm maybe that's my favorite question I, I've been given in the two forums we've had because you've you've really we should have we should have addressed it and we didn't. So let me begin and, and take my best shot at responding because you said a couple of things. Um, here's where I'm going to start. Uh, the silos uh, must come down. So when I arrived eight months ago, there was a silo, let's just call it as it is. There was a silo between student services and academic affairs, and there was a silo between CWCE and academic affairs. Those must disappear. I think effectively between student services and academic affairs, it's gone. Is there room for improvement? Sure. Does it feel like a different day? Yes. CWCE, there's a lot of change that has taken place there over the last eight months and a lot more still to come. Uh, Mio very graciously has stood up and said, yes, I will keep this train running on time. I am deeply grateful to Mio for, for being willing to do that and to sit with me and help us figure out how do we do this work um, and what I will tell you is going to be a radically different way. Um, that's the first piece. The second piece, um, I agreed with some of what you said and I'm going to sort of push back on some of the other things. And so let me start here. When I think about this college and what I want us to build together, um, is it's just a, it's a pathway. And we are going to welcome all students, wherever they are starting, we are going to say, welcome to the community college, you belong here. And if in fact it is a student who comes to us and is an English language learner, or for whatever reason, is reading or writing at, say, the third or fourth grade level, it's going to be our job to welcome them in, figure out what do they need right now. And you're right, what they need right now may in fact be a short-term training that's going to put them into a CNA, something that's going to let them provide for their families at that very moment. So I'm with you up to that point. Where I would, I guess, push back, or at least what might be inferred, is when I begin to think about questions of equity. So if I think about, if we just draw a big, fat bell curve, uh, and we think about our students, the 15,000, they're going to be some portion of that 15,000 that exists sort of over on this side and who for a variety of reasons could be extremely successful at any higher ed institution in this country. And, and they're here for, for a variety of reasons that we all know. Then there are going to be folks on another side of that bell curve who no matter what we do in terms of our offering and our support likely will not be able to cross that threshold into an associate degree. We recognize that. I meet, I meet all of those students in our halls, all, all times. What I want us to focus on, though, is inside the bell curve is where most of our students are. And what I know when I look at things like developmental coursework, that is, when you begin to slice it according to race and class and ethnicity, it, it is overdetermined in terms of your socioeconomic status and your race. So what we can't do is say, well, that group of students then is going to be relegated because we actually don't believe that we can support them successfully through a pathway. I know we can, you know, and, and I'll, you'll hear me when I say this. I think about Sotomayor's example, her story, Justice Sotomayor. Listen to her one day talk about what it was like to go to Princeton. Right? And, and when you hear that, you think, that's a lot of our students. There's, there's enormous capacity, right? Those students need. Pardon me? Yeah, those students need not, not only the academic support, which we have programs in place that yep. probably need some improvement, um, but having run job training programs for you know, 25 years. Sure. sure. You, know, in, in yeah. academic, you know what they need? Child care. Yeah. They yeah. need yeah. transportation. Yep. Okay? Yeah. And they, they need to be, uh, you know, uh, a MAPLO 500 needs to be, you know, 50 hours a week. Yeah. You know, I mean, it needs so, to be a lot more yep. than the 50, you know, it's, it's 
So I, this, I could have this conversation for the rest of the day, and I'm sure there are other questions. Class, uh, they, they can do it, but they don't have child care. Yep. yep. They can do it, but then, uh, you know, uh, the rift is terrible. You know? Yep. So, so I, I want to make sure I get other, we get to other questions. I would just say I agree with every word of what you just said. And what I would ask us to hold on to, however, is this concept of it's a, it's a, it's a continuous pathway, and it's going to be fluid and permeable between the non-credit side of the house and the credit side of the house. Where are some areas where I know we need to do better? In terms of the non-credit, we actually have plenty of credentialed professionals in the state of Rhode Island who aren't coming to us. They're paying a whole lot more money to go to the New England Institute of Technology and, and other places because we don't have it yet, right? That's a population I want to I want to grab for so many reasons, right? And, and the final example I'll give, because you cited CNA, Rosemary and I started seven months ago looking at that population. I know that population intimately. I will tell you, you will not support your family on the salary that a CNA's wages give you. So it's unacceptable. I refuse to say, we're going to take a certain percentage of our students and that's all we're going to train them to do. And we've done our job. We haven't done our job. So what do we do? So with the leadership of Dr. Costigan, we're going to build a program and it's going to go from CNA to LPN until one day they, you know, they grow up, if they have that drive and they have that capacity, they're going to be her. Those are the, that's the kind of development that I want to think about at that college. Yeah. So thank you for the question. Um, let me turn it back over to the room. Uh, Leslie and then Mike. Well, you know, I am the president of ESPA. Many of my members have degrees, many don't, right? So I had a very interesting conversation with Alfonso the other day, and I walked away from that conversation with two thoughts. Number one, my first thought was, he's brilliant. <laughs> my second thought was, what can we do as an institution, right, to improve the lives of not just my members, but PSA, and when I hear you talk about the governor wanting 75% of Rhode Islanders to have some sort of higher ed degree, I can't help but think, why not start here? What can we do in-house to improve the lives of the people who work here? What better message to send to the governor's office than to say, we're committed, we support you, and we started here, right? 80%, 90% of our employees have some sort of training, certificate, degree in general, and I ask as an institution, right, what can we do? There's definitely, there's an educational incentive, but sometimes it's, it's not really about money, right? What can we do to allow them to make it easier for them to kind of access, you know, something along the lines? And I guess I don't know the answer, but, you know, I definitely think it's a question worth asking. Leslie, I really appreciate it. I think it's right on point, and I heard you carefully, and so let's talk about it. Thank you. Um, yeah, just um, you mentioned that 75 25, and you spoke with the governor. Is she aware of what we have to do at the K through 12 level to get these kids ready for college? Because as Rosemary said, a lot of these kids come here requiring math and English, yeah. and that's a key reason they don't persist. If they fall behind the eight ball, they forget it, I can't do this. What can we do as an institution help those kids before they graduate high school and build that relationship so that we get them here ready to go and they want to come here because we helped them in high school. So I'm going to let Rosemary answer it. I'll simply say uh, I'm sure many of you have heard President Dooley talk about this very topic and he focuses I think on, on two things. One, um, the um, difference in funding between what K-12 through gets and what higher ed gets and then just what we inherit. Right? So I, I guess I'll say only one piece and then turn it over to Rosemary. Um, you're absolutely right. And again, you know those students well. I know those students very well. Um, do I find it incredibly frustrating? Uh, I've looked at, when I was at Europe, I probably reviewed 2,000 high school graduates from the state of Rhode Island. I looked at their transcripts. Uh, how do I say this diplomatically? Um, there was room for improvement in terms of a, a diploma that had been granted and what they actually were able to do. Um, so do I feel that frustration intensely? Yes, I do, because of the reason you started with. Our, they come here, they get discouraged, they run out of money and they leave. It's unacceptable. And we still have to figure out how we solve it. 
And so what I'm really cognizant of is they're still coming through our doors and we are, we are working aggressively with RIDE. We are telling the story you just outlined across the state. We are going to make, I think, substantial inroads with, with what you're going to come back to. And in the meantime, we got folks walking through our door right now that we got to figure out how to serve. So thank you. I, I really, I hear you and I'll just. Well, and, and just briefly, one of, the, um, one of the points on Monday was that the, the regulations, I think they were approved Monday night, new regs for K through 12 and graduation requirements. So there will be four units of math. That was something that we found that was variable from district to district. Um, so they're going to 20 credits for high school. They are uh, forming teams uh, to increase the rigor and criteria uh, of, of their assessments. All I heard at that meeting was assessment, 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 which is what we're bringing in and we have to do here um, at, at a more intense level. So um, I think the good news is this is, um, this is happening in real time and it is important that we're there. It didn't feel good to them when we talk about um, two thirds of our students coming in needing developmental. I mean, as we, we don't, we would not want to hear our uh, four year partners saying that. I, I love it when I meet a uh, professor from URI, Rick, Brian, that say their strongest students are the transfer students from CCRI. Um, I, I, my, a neighbor of mine is at Bryant, and he said they're strongest business students. And it is wonderful to hear that. Um, and so uh, I can't imagine being in their shoes where we're constantly, and it's reality that we're saying, you know, you're sending us students who are not prepared. That's a reflection on their work, on their profession, on their life's, you know, purpose. So um, what's really very encouraging is that we're now at the table. We're going to be able to consult with one another. It's going to be important for our faculty in higher ed to understand what's happening in those models in K through 12 because those students will be on our doorstep. And we need to know what, what are the teaching um, philosophies, et cetera, that those students are being exposed to. So we are off to a very, very strong start. And this task force that will meet um, in two weeks, th that's uh, exactly purposed with that. So we're a little over. Um, I, I, wish I, was, I was listening so carefully, I wasn't paying attention to the time. If everyone, do we want to take one more question and then say we're good? One more question from the room? Isn't anyone going to ask when we're going to have another great party like the one we had a month ago? <laughs> I've totally committed. We're going to have a great party once a year. This guy's going to figure out how we pay for it. Uh, thank you, guys. Please, please. I've been doing this early alert program with Sarah and Rosemary. Uh, some of the faculty have been submitting uh, uh, notices to us that they're worried about a student in their class. And so um, I've been calling all the students. And uh, I just want to kind of back up what um, Sarah was saying. You know, customer service is so incredible because uh, the students that I do reach, they're so appreciative that someone reached out and said, hey, you know, I'm calling on behalf of your math teacher. She's worried about your performance in class. You know, you have some issues. Would you like to come in and meet with a tutor? And, and they're blown away that somebody from, you know, first they think I'm the math teacher. No, you know, <laughs> I need the class. Um, but I can get you a tutor. Or, you know, maybe you need to speak to someone in advising. Or I think you really need to go back and talk to the teacher again because I'm not hearing the same thing. You're telling me a different story. So that feedback is so critical in taking that extra step and, and saying hi to someone or, you know, uh, one of the late constant ladies that are always in the success center for years. I don't know when she's going to graduate. Um, <laughs> And her tutor told me she got an 88 on her history test. So, honestly, she's a little annoying. I've had to not get to engage. But I was like, I gotta say, great job to her. And so I saw her last night and like, I heard you got an 88 on your history test. Isn't that great? And she lit up. That's awesome. So, please, you know, let's continue doing that. We are here for the students. They're our job, they're our bread and butter. And I, two more really quick thoughts on that. One, a tremendous thanks to Anne to you and your team for that work. But two, this idea that our October, November, December charge really is to get people coming back for spring. So when you think about what is enrollment, spring enrollment is all about retention. So if the only question you ask every student you encounter from here to the end of the year is, hey, do you coming back for next semester? Are you registered next semester? And respond to what you're hearing. Sometimes they're 
financial aid challenges, scheduling challenges, like we can solve most of the challenges if we learn about them now. Um, so with that, uh, enjoy the day. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you.